You're listening to the Patenting for Inventors podcast with registered patent attorney, Dr. Adam Diamond, founder of Diamond Patent Law, the number one source for securing your intellectual property needs. Now, here's your host, Adam Diamond. Hello and welcome to the Patenting for Inventors podcast, episode 13, Claim Drafting Part 5, 10 Quick Tips for Claim Drafting. My name is Dr. Adam Diamond, founder and owner of Diamond Patent Law in Los Angeles, California, and I can be contacted through my website at patentingforinventors.com, that's patentingforinventors.com, to answer all your patent and intellectual property questions. I can't cover everything about claim drafting in this podcast, but I thought I would finish the topic of claim drafting with 10 quick tips. I covered some of the big picture aspects of claim drafting in episodes 9 through 12 of the podcast, but... In this episode, I want to just cover briefly some of the other things to think about when drafting claims. If this is the first episode you're listening to, then I'd suggest to at least go back to episode 9, where I start going into the claims, or even all the way back to episode 1 to start from the very beginning of intellectual property. These tips are for utility patents and not design patents, which I'll cover in a later episode, and these tips are also mostly helpful for inventions that are physical in nature, but they're also applicable to method claims. Alright, so here we go. Tip number one, keep your preamble short and broad. The preamble is the introduction of your claim. If your invention is for a megaphone, just start with a megaphone. Don't go into the details, but if you want, you can also write a very brief purpose, such as a megaphone used to increase the volume of a person's voice. I covered tip one in more detail in episode 10, so if you want to know more about the preamble, just listen to that episode. Tip number two, the last word of preamble should be the word comprising. Unless you really know what you're doing, do not use the word consisting of. This is very important. If your claim starts with a bicycle comprising two wheels and a handlebar, what this means is that your bicycle has at least two wheels and a handlebar, which is probably what you mean. If your claim said a bicycle consisting of two wheels and a handlebar, what this means is that your bicycle only has two wheels and a handlebar. It means that it doesn't have a chain, it doesn't have a frame, it doesn't have a seat, etc., You would never want to use the word consisting in this case because someone could just come along and add any feature to design around your claim. If someone made a bicycle that had two wheels, a handlebar, and a seat, they wouldn't be infringing your claim because you used the word consisting of instead of comprising. But if you had used the word comprising, as long as they had at least the list of things that you mentioned, even if they had more, they could still be infringing your claim. This is a really gross oversimplification because no one today we get a patent on a bicycle having two wheels and a handlebar. But I just use this as an example to show you the difference between the words consisting of and comprising. You rarely, if ever, should use the word consisting of. Chemistry patents are one area where you'll see consisting of a lot. But be really cautious if you use it. I think I've only used that term one time in all my years of practice. Tip number three, proper antecedent basis. In patent language, what this means is using the words a and the in the right places. The first time you write a limitation in a claim, like wheel or a handlebar, you should write a wheel and a handlebar. After that, if you refer to the same object again, then use the words the wheel or the handlebar. Instead of the word the, you can also use the word said, so you can say said wheel or said handlebar, but there's a trend away from that language because it sounds overly formal. The only time you don't have to use the word a first is if the thing you're talking about inherently has it. For example, if part of my claims I need to talk about the center of a circle, I don't have to write a center of a circle because circles inherently have a center and there's only one of them. So you can write the center of a circle, even if it's the first time you're talking about the center. There are times where I felt I should realistically have been able to say the without having to say a first, like the center of the circle. But then I got a rejection and instead of fighting it, I just changed it to how the examiner wanted it. So now, even though in theory you can sometimes write the the first time you talk about an element, I just don't do it at all anymore. Tip number four, using wherein clauses. When I start writing claims, I like to start with the big picture. Let's say for some reason in my claims, having a rubber wheel with metal spikes is really essential to the invention to differentiate it from other wheels that are out there in similar inventions. What a wherein clause does is it limits the claim to something more narrow. Now you could write in your claim, a rubber wheel having metal spikes. But what I like to do is write down the big picture first. So I might write a wheel wherein the wheel is made of rubber and has at least one metal spike. You could even make it broader and say a rolling member 
wherein the rolling member is a rubber wheel having at least one metal spike. This is not a hard and fast rule because there are lots of ways to write claims, but the reason I like it is that if I ever need to make amendments, I can keep my big picture word the same, the wheel or the rolling member, and not change it at all. And then just play around in the where in clause if I need to start narrowing it down to get a claim allowed. Tip number five, using whereby clauses. Some people confuse where in and whereby clauses, but they're different and you have to be careful about them. A where in clause limits the claim. If I say in my claims, a wheel, wherein the wheel is comprised of rubber, and someone in their invention does the same thing, but their wheel is only made of wood, then they designed around your claim because your wherein clause limited your invention to just rubber wheels. A whereby clause usually doesn't limit the claim. So for example, if I wrote a wheel whereby the wheel allows the bicycle to roll downhill, it's not really saying anything about the structure of the wheel that limits it. It just describes the purpose of it. Most of the time, if you describe a purpose of something, it's not going to limit the claim. So someone can't come along with a special bicycle that only rolls uphill and says, your claim requires the wheel to roll downhill, and my wheel only rolls uphill. Most of the time, that defense isn't going to work, because in general, the whereby clauses are just helpful to the reader or examiner to understand the general purpose of the limitation. There have been some cases where whereby clauses have been used to limit the claim, which is why some patent attorneys are against using whereby clauses at all. Their attitude is, anything I say could be used against me, so why say anything that isn't 100% necessary? And I get that. But I also think that they're useful in letting the examiner understand how the invention works, which is going to make it more likely that you'll get an allowance. I see both sides, and I use them, but you do want to be careful about how you use them, because if you use it wrong, it can be thought of as the same as a wherein clause. For example, if you said a wheel whereby the wheel is made of rubber. Yes, you used the word whereby, but you used it incorrectly. And you can tell by the rest of the sentence that what you really did was just mix up the words whereby and wherein. And what you're saying is that your wheel is actually a rubber wheel. So if you do use them, use them correctly, keep them pretty broad about their function, and don't discuss any structural limitations in the whereby clause. And don't use words or phrases like whereby the wheel can only be used to roll downhill. Because if you go into that kind of detail about the functions of what it can't do, that's the type of situation where it could be used to limit your claim. Tip number six, making sure your limitations are in the summary or description of the invention. I haven't gone into the summary or description of the invention yet, and I'll get to that later, but it's really important that every limitation in your claims is described and discussed somewhere else in your application besides the claims. If I claimed my invention includes a wheel and a handlebar, make sure that somewhere in the description of your invention, either in pictures or words or both, you've actually discussed a wheel and handlebar. Because if the only place you mentioned your wheel and handlebar are in the claims, then you're going to get a rejection because the examiner is going to say that your application didn't fulfill the written description and enablement requirement to get a patent. It can be really hard to overcome that kind of rejection, so make sure everything in your claims is discussed somewhere else in the patent application. Tip number seven, connect the pieces. If your invention is a physical object, connect your pieces and say how they work together. In the bicycle example, you don't just want to say your invention has two wheels, a frame, a handlebar, and pedals. You'll probably get a rejection if you don't say how they work together, and it doesn't have to be overly detailed. But somewhere in the claims, you probably want to say that the handlebar is connected to at least one of the wheels. You'll want to say that the pedals are connected to at least one of the wheels. Because if you don't say how your pieces fit together, then the examiner is going to find something where all these pieces are separate, like some catalog of goods, and just say that your invention isn't new because all those pieces exist. What makes your invention new and non-obvious is the way that they're all connected together to make a functioning device. My point isn't to say that the bicycle I described is non-obvious. It's just to say that you have to say how the pieces are connected together to make your invention. Tip number eight, start broad and then narrow down. When you write your first claim, think about the fewest number of required elements needed to accomplish the goal of your invention. If you think your invention requires parts A, B, C, D, and E, but you think maybe it could be done with just parts A, B, and C, then when you write your first claim, just write that your invention requires A, B, and C. If it gets rejected because it's too broad, and just having those three things together are obvious, then you can always go back and add in parts D and E to the claims. What's harder to do is if you first start out saying that your invention requires A, B, C, D, and E, and you get it allowed and your patent issues, it's really hard to go back and tell the patent office, oh, I made a mistake, my invention really only requires A, B, and C, 
So I want to change my patent. Sometimes it can be done with a reissue patent, which I'll talk about in a later episode, but you want to avoid that if you can and try to get a patent in the beginning for as broad of an invention as you can. If you're not sure how narrow you should go, you can put those extra features in dependent claims as backups in case your broad claim is found invalid or gets rejected. I talked about independence and dependent claims in the last episode, so listen to that episode again if you have any questions about the purpose and how to write independent and dependent claims. Tip number nine, using a thesaurus and other patents to help you out. I think using a thesaurus is a great idea for an inventor because it makes you think about what the limitations to your invention really are. Let's say that you think your invention requires a rope. Think about whether it really requires a rope. Check a thesaurus and see if people could accomplish the same thing using one of the closely related words. Could they do your invention with a string, a thread, a cable? If the answer is yes, then think of a word that covers all of those things, something like a flexible elongated member. That pretty much covers all those things. If you think a rope is really the best thing for your invention, you might want to put it in a dependent claim, but avoid really specific terminology in your broad independent claim. Sometimes a thesaurus won't help you pick out the exact right word. Maybe you wouldn't have thought of a flexible elongated member on your own. So what I would suggest to do is doing a patent search and searching for words like rope and see how other people claimed it. Hopefully, you'll come across some good terminology that you can use, but you want to be careful just because if someone else used that terminology in their patent, it doesn't mean it was a good use of that terminology, and it doesn't mean that it will work for you. Still, it's a good starting point. You don't need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to patent language terminology. Tip number 10, don't focus too much of the time of filing on your claims. I'm hesitant to actually say this because it's a double-edged sword. I tell people that the claims are the most important part of their invention, but at the same time, they're actually the least important part of the application at the time of filing. This is because claims can be amended, while there are a lot more rules and restrictions on amending other parts of the application, such as drawings or descriptions of your invention. You can always amend your claims if, and this is a big if, you have support for those claims somewhere else in your application. So let's go back to the bicycle example, and let's say at this time, no one had ever made a bicycle before, and only unicycles existed. In your application, you described your new invention that has two wheels, pedals, a frame connecting the wheels, and a handlebar to steer. In your claims, you just claimed that your invention had wheels and a pedal. The examiner would reject your claim because she would find just some example of a unicycle that had wheels and a pedal. That's okay, because after your claim is rejected, you can go back and add into the claim that already listed a wheel and a pedal, that it also has a second wheel, a frame connecting the wheels, and handlebars to steer. Then the examiner might allow it. But you're only allowed to do that if your application already described the invention as having two wheels, a frame, and a handlebar. So what's more important in the beginning, at the time of filing the application, is that you fully describe your invention so that if you have to make any changes to the claims, you can make them. Now you can't just disregard the claims, because if you don't think about the claims, what you're probably not doing is not thinking about what your invention really is. And if you're not thinking about what your invention really is, then you're probably not going to describe all the features that you need to, and then you'll have the problem of amending the claims if you get a rejection. The point is, if you're coming up on a deadline, it's better to focus on fleshing out the description of all the embodiments of your invention than spending time trying to figure out the exact words of claims. Also, if you have an attorney, let your attorney focus on the claims while you as the inventor focus on coming up with the best possible description. Like I said, there are so many things to think about when you draft claims that I can't cover them all here. It takes years of practice to really hone your claim drafting skills, and there's an art as well as a science because there's no magic formula to the perfect claim or how to write them. In the next episode, I'm going to start going over the details of some other required parts of the patent, and I'm going to start with the patent drawings. If you want help with drafting your patent application and claims, I do offer those services through my practice at Diamond Patent Law. So please check out my website where you can contact me at patentingforinventors.com. That's patentingforinventors.com. I'm Adam Diamonds, and until next time, keep on inventing. Thanks for listening to the Patenting for Inventors podcast with host Adam Diamond. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review on iTunes. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only. The facts of every legal matter are unique and the content of this podcast should not be construed as offering legal advice for your specific legal situation. 
For more information and help with your own intellectual property needs, contact Adam Diamond at patentingforinventors.com. That's patentingforinventors.com or call Diamond Patent Law at 424-281-0162. The preceding information may be considered an attorney advertisement and does not establish any attorney-client relationship.